when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, he will correct whatever mistakes they are making. But they have been following the deen of Islam. He doesn't have to give them the deen of Islam for the first time, you dumb dumb. They are already following the deen of Islam, but they were making mistakes. And so when he returns, every single one of them who follows him, I'm not talking about followers of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, because we don't follow Jesus. The Muslims, the followers of the deen of Islam that came with Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, we are not followers of Jesus. No! We never were and we will never be. We are followers of this Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And when he returns, he does not come to us. No! He's coming to his ummah, not to us. He is coming to Banu Israel. Allah said that in the Quran. But you don't want to turn to the Quran for guidance. So what can I do? Ya Bani Israel, inni Rasulullah ilaykum. I am the messenger of Allah to you. Rasulan ila Bani Israel. This is the Quran. And of course, there are two terms, synonymous. One is Banu Israel and the other is Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab. So when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, all those of the Ahlul Kitab who follow him, who would not be a people who say that a man can marry another man, and get a stinking marriage certificate. No, those are not his followers. When he returns, then he will correct them and declare to them, and they'll accept it, that Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, is a prophet of Allah. And they will all accept it. And secondly, that the Quran is the word of Allah. And they will all accept it. All of them. There will not be a single one of them of the Ahlul Kitab who will not accept that the Quran is the word of Allah and that Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is the messenger of Allah. But they don't have to enter this ummah. No? They are in Islam already. They are already in Islam. They do not have to enter our ummah. No. So they will follow their Nabi. Even though they accept Muhammad alayhi salatu as a messenger of Allah. Every single one of them. And they accept the Quran as the word of Allah. Every single one of them. They will continue to follow their Nabi and we will follow our Nabi. And so history will end with two ummahs. The Ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam and the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And there will be love and affection between us. But my critics can't swallow that. Why would Gog and Magog throw arrows at the sky? Will they be targeting jinns or aliens? Is there a possibility of a jinn or alien invasion prior to this event? You have to go to Surah Rahman to recognize and understand the link between Gog and Magog, the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, NATO, and Star Wars, and Star Wars. In the must be a hundred thousand lectures I've already delivered on Gog and Magog. <laughs> Must be about a hundred thousand lectures, where nobody else lectures on the subject. No, I'm the only one uh, in which I've identified Gog and Magog. Okay, uh, Surah to 
Surat al Anbiya, the, the Karya. And then Gog and Magog would be the Judeo Christian Zionist alliance, which has NATO as its uh, military arm. That's Gog and Magog. Mm. But the link between Gog and Magog and Star Wars is there in Surah Al Rahman. Mm. Sorry. And, uh, and yes, it most certainly has a connection with the jinn. That is why you have the verse repeated how many times? 31 times. Thirty-one times. Rabbi Kuma means two people. One, human beings, and the other, jinn, and both evil. Hmm? So the verse of the Quran, which is linked with Star Wars, and with shooting the arrows up into the sky, which is the missiles and so on, is the ayah which, in which Allah says, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins. And he's not speaking to all human beings. And he's not speaking to all jinns. He's speaking to the human beings and the jinn who have been constantly addressed in this surah. And 31 times he has asked them, he has said, for be a yalai rabbikuma to kazdiban. So you can't make a mistake. Who is he talking about? He's talking about this community of human beings who are evil and this community of jinn who are evil and who are in alliance with each other. And it is these people who are dressed, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins. In istata'atum an tanfuzu min aktaris samawat. There you are, the Star Wars. Aktaris samawat wal if you wish to embark on the effort to explore and penetrate the stratas of the sky and the Samawat and the stratas of the earth, which includes the ocean, the depths of the ocean, Fanfuzu, go ahead and pursue the effort. So the jinn are helping human beings in this effort of missiles and satellites and all of these things. But then Allah, I think I'm speaking a little bit too much today. I'm, I'm taking too much out of the, too, the cat is coming out of the bag. I don't want NATO to know this. <laughs> I don't want to NATO know, to, to know this. No, I, I prefer NATO does not know this at this time. No, let them go <laughs> do their research in Surah Al-Rahman. Yes, I think I spoke enough. I don't want to speak anymore and reveal anymore. That there is in Surah Al Rahman that which explains definitely that the jinn are supporting the efforts for exploration of the, st of the, the stratus of the sky and the depths of the earth. Mm -hmm. in, modern term, in modern terms, if we say jinns are aliens, do you believe that we are living among them and that Dajjal's science and technology, technological evolution or revolution is actually alien technology? This is the kind of research I want my students to do when I'm no longer in this world. There are scientists and scholars in the Western world who have integrity in them and who have not lost integrity, no. And these people will fearlessly go back to the Middle Ages and show the link between the scientific and technological revolution and what was called in that time, they call it magic. And when they use the word magic at that time, they, don't, they didn't use the word magic in the sense in which the casual, frivolous way in which we use the word magic today. No. Magic was a word which was respectable at that time. And it referred to whatever was supernatural that could be used to influence the natural order. And yes, it's, I agree, I confirm it, they're mm. correct, but it's just that we call it the jinn. But this is research work for future Islamic eschatology. Why do you say the sun rising from the west is symbolic when the Quran confirms in three ayats, um, Surah Rad, Surah Fatih, Surah Yasin, that the sun runs its course for a term appointed or for a period determined. 
So if the Quran says Allah's creation does not change, is this statement not irrelevant to this subject? Well, you have to show me in the Quran where Allah says in the Quran that the sun rises from the west. Why don't you cause it to rise from the east? This is Sulema, this is Ibrahim alayhi salam confronting the king. And Ibrahim alayhi salam says in the Quran, uh, I believe you must be familiar with it. Uh, this is, I mean, plain and clear and direct language. I don't think Ibrahim alayhi salam was making a mistake. He said to the king, the sun rises from the east. Why don't you cause it to rise from the west? Hmm? Meaning, the natural order, the one which Allah has ordained, is the sun rising from the east. And the rival to the natural order is the one that he suggests, come on, let it rise from the west. If the Dajjal wants to be a rival to the truth, then the Dajjal will have the cause of the sun to rise from the west. And I say he's already done that. Because a literal explanation or understanding of the sun rising from the west is not possible. It is in conflict with the Quran because Allah says, La tabdila li khalkillah. Allah's creation does not change. What is Allah's creation? But I just said it. I just said it. Allah's creation is one in which the sun rises from the east and it sets in the west. I don't know whether I have to use another language to explain it. That's what the Quran says.